Welcome to another Axe Church podcast. Glad you're with us today. My name is Hunter Croft. I am a staff member here at Axe Church, and we are a church in Camas, Washington. I uh, love it if you check us out at www.axecamas.org. Today we have uh, Pastor David with us, and we are going to be talking a little bit um, just about how we're going to talk about personalities. I'll leave it pretty open because I don't know exactly where the conversation is going to go, but we're going to talk about how how our personalities affect our Christian walk and, and things like that. Um, and so how are, how are you today, Pastor David? I'm living the dream as I always am. Oh, you're um, still asleep. What kind of a dream it is, is you know, <laughs> depends on the day, but so far so good. Um, I'm going to read a little passage here out of out of 1 Corinthians 13. This is verse 11. It says, uh, and this is the love chapter for those of you who are wondering where we are. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as, just as I also am known. Um, I think... You know, one of what we sort of had talked about earlier, Hunter, is you know how how have if we get back to the roots of our personality, our childhood, you know, the kind of the way we grew up, and we sort of look at how those things have grown into mm-hmm. um, the maybe some of the spiritual gifts that we have that the Lord's given us, maybe um, you know how they've shaped us, how our experiences have shaped us, and we go back to the roots, we can see I think both those things that the Lord is now using now to to great effect. In, in the in a believer who's growing and maturing, and also maybe we we can also see, and this is one of the things we walk through in like steps uh, class and and some of the recovery stuff. We we can also see the roots of sin that is in our life, some of which goes way 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 back um, to where we've we've believed things that we shouldn't have believed, or we've developed uh, habits or personality traits that have caused us now to to stumble. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's I think it's worth talking through that. So. Let's let's start like this. I mean, um, you were a child much, much uh, less time ago than I was. Yeah, it was last week sometime. Um, I mean, I acted like a child probably much more recently than you have, but you were an actual child much, much uh, uh, shorter time ago. So tell me about your childhood. Tell me what kind of a – that your perception – I really should have had your parents in here. Yeah. Um, oh, they were here not too long yeah, ago. Yeah, they were. I should have had them in here because they could tell us the real skinny. But tell me your perception of what kind of a child you were. Um. Well, funny, we actually talked about it a little bit because we, we had a three-year-old with us some of the weekend, and so they were saying, oh, you were just like him in this way or you were totally different in this way. Um, I guess I was a pretty talkative little kid, um, but I think I, I, m- my impression of how I was, and both from memory and from hearing things, um, was that I was very concerned with the rules to, to like an extent that people would be like, stop worrying about that. Like you're you're too concerned with the rules. Um, whereas my brother was the opposite. He was he was concerned with the rules and he just wanted to figure out ways that he could get around them. Um, he would have made a good lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you should tell him that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he'll start a new career. No, he would. I think he would hate that because he also <laughs> he also hates anything that is not a hundred percent sincere, and uh-huh. I don't think he would like that. Um, How dare you? Sorry, I mean. Nothing against lawyers, but sometimes you have to be a little insincere, don't uh, it's, you? It's, Is it's, that part of it? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't think you have to be. That, oh, okay. You know, it's the ninety nine percent. It's the impression of, that he would have though. attorneys. You know, that ninety nine percent that makes the one percent look bad. Yeah. So, you know, it's not, I, there, obviously there's there's. <laughs> I don't want to get too far afield here, but uh, <laughs> there's a perception that a lot of attorneys are either are or are willing to be insincere in order to get an advantage for their client or whatever. I my experience is, is that that's less common than you would think. Yeah, um, it but, just is yeah. good for TV shows. It does make good TV shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that I was yeah very, and I, I think that that. Um, cons- concern with the rules came out of uh insecurity with with my i didn't want to upset anybody so i I was i was insecure with my um i was i was insecure that i would end up upsetting somebody i really didn't want to do that so i was always very concerned with the rules very uh and that and that led to being kind of timid i think i was a a somewhat timid kid um not getting in a lot of fist fights no, only with my brother that I can. I don't. I, I honestly he's, don't. He's think, younger than you. Yeah, okay. yeah. I can't think of any. Fist so you fights. picked you picked ones you could win. Yeah, I mean he was about the same size as me was for he? five years there. Okay, 
but now I'm still much bigger than he is because he got my mom's height gene and I got my dad's. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just I, I think overall a timidness and shyness that wasn't necessarily um, – something that I was born with but got developed as my insecurities uh, took a hold of me, I think, is is where that mostly came from. And I'll say for a long time, I think I thought of personalities as a pretty static thing, as a, um, as this is it, you can try to work around it, but that's it. And to an extent, I think that there are some things that you're never going to change. But I think it is much more um, malleable than I gave... Um, that part of me credit. I think I assumed that it was, um, it, it was, you're stuck with it. Hope you, hope you like it. Cause it's not going anywhere else. Um, but I think I have, uh, I think, and I also think, you know, my memory is short on, on who I am. And I think if I would have looked at myself four years ago, I'd be surprised how different I actually am. Whereas I kind of feel like I've been the same way my entire life. Um, well, the changes are probably slow enough that you don't see yeah, them happening. Yeah, I don't. I don't feel like I grew six inches overnight either. What but. would your parents say about you now versus you then, or, or have you ever had that conversation with them? Oh, I don't know if I've had that specific conversation with them, um, but I do think um, from from kind of pivotal moments in my you know my education and in um, getting a job, I think they've been able to see. I think I think they kind of were able to see me go away for four years, basically, um, and only see me a couple times. But you know, might not actually be able to see any growth during those times because it was you know Christmas or something like that. And uh, and then look at you know they come to church and they see me um, serving at church and they see me um, preach a sermon or something like that for school. And I think I think they are able to see the change much better than I am because they they have that old memory of me still. Um, and so they've, I think they've been, um, surprised by how much I've changed. Um, yeah. I just don't see it myself. <laughs> I think it'd be harder. I think it's harder for us to see ourselves in general um, yeah, true. Or, or, you know, doing this kind of reflection or self-assessment that it would take to really, uh, see and, and connect with how we're changing or, or even who we are is mm-hmm. I think missing for a lot of people. Um, yeah. depends on how introspective you are, I guess, but even if you are, People aren't always honest with themselves. Um, yeah, we tend it's to, hard. Yeah, especially I, when honesty would be painful. Yeah, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about, um, you know, the tennis player who hits a good considers his rare good shots to be his normal form, <laughs> and his and his regular bad shots to be you know his off anomalies. Yeah, those are the anomalies, <laughs> right? And that's kind of how we look at ourselves, especially when it comes to sin, things like that. It's like when if you do something bad, right? Hunter does something bad, and I see it, and I'm like, you know, you tell me a lie, let's say. Then it's like, oh, Hunter's a liar. He's always lying. Yeah, he's just a, he's a liar. Hunter's a liar. But if I tell a lie, it's like, no, 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 I'm not a liar. That was an off I thing. I messed up, you know. And so we expect all this grace for ourselves, yeah. Because you know, we we tend to think um, highly of ourselves. We pretend to give ourselves a lot of grace and whatever. It's not true for everybody. Some people are very, very hard on themselves. But generally, the human condition, I think, it's kind of like we see our mistakes as one-offs yeah. and are the good things we do as the normal part of who we are as where – that's not always the way we're perceived by other people where yeah. they might see it the very opposite. Usually that, not. That the mistakes that we make are actually our normal and that the good stuff that we do, do is kind of our off thing. Now, the, the truth is I think somewhere in between that and it depends on – at what level you're of maturity you are and, and how much you're being transformed by Christ and, mm-hmm. and, and what's happening there. And so for me, you know, I grew up, I was, I know I was sensitive as a, as a child, like pretty sensitive, uh, could get my feelings hurt pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know that I would say I was timid um, or, or like a particularly like a people pleaser um, but to some extent, I think I, I know that I liked to, or that I've always been someone who, as a middle child and other things, I've always been someone who's sort of um, come in to help people avoid conflict, or like if I see conflict, oh, yeah. or if I see, uh, you know, whatever, I want to mediate that. Mm-hmm. I want to help. You know, I know that there was a time in life where I felt like, okay, you know, here's what's going on in my family dynamic, and I'm the one who needs to sort of 
be the glue that like sort of does yeah, this or yeah. does that. Um, and so that's definitely part of of the makeup that I had. And I think it has something to do with, um, you know, be, becoming an attorney um, mm-hmm. and, and becoming a pastor. I think that the Lord is, has taken things. And some of that, some of my issues, which is to say my sensitiveness that I had or, or my desire to um, help people work through conflict or whatever, probably some of that was born out of some negative experiences, some mm-hmm. things that happened that were negative, and yet, you know, this goes back to that Romans eight twenty eight stuff. You know, uh-huh. all things work together for good for those who are called according to, um, you know, who are in Christ, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, called, called according to His purpose, and so I think that there's a lot of things that that shaped my personality when I was young. Some good, some bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but the bad and the good have been have been able to be formed um, as I've been transformed, as I'm being transformed yeah. into things that that if I will let him, and if I will live in the spirit, the Lord will use for good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my guess is that the reason you were a rule follower and whatever and worried about upsetting people is there's got to be something there. I mean, something had to have caused you to have that sort of outlook. You yeah. Know? I don't want to upset people. I don't want to whatever. I don't know if you know what that is or not, but Can't but something, of, right, yeah. because you're so young, right? Yeah, yeah. But something happened there. And of course, the Lord has used that. How, how would you, let's take that specific thing about your personality, the the rule following, the... Um, wanting to make sure that you weren't upsetting people. Tell me how that has progressed in your life, if you had to look back on it. Like, how has the Lord transformed that, and what is he using it for for good now? Um, I think as I got into, you know, older grades and then into college and a job, um, I think it probably manifests itself in perfectionism and not in like a... um, in a hard working way, like, oh, I'm going to work really hard at this to get it perfect, but more in a, um, this isn't going to be perfect, so I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm not saying I do that a lot, but I think that I sometimes have a tendency to go, um, you know, if I have a to-do list and there's something on there that I don't think I can do perfectly, I'll move it to the bottom of the list um, because I don't want to uh, do anything outside of air quotes rules, which now... um, Maybe my my perception of rules has changed from um, how not to get a spanking, but now the the rules are how to. And we don't do that much here. No, yeah, fair. that's not a not a common practice right. here. I prefer. I mean, I'm not saying never, so you should be careful. But I'm gonna, we don't, yeah, I'm gonna ask never. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I think there's probably some laws on the books about I, that, so I hope so. We so. won't spank you. Yeah, um, but now the rules are more about success and. Um, and perception, you know, um, not even not even actual success sometimes. Um, you know, I, I always want actual success, but um, I think short-sightedly I'll look at my perception and what I'm doing. Um, and so if I perceive something I'm going to do as not um, something that is going to be praiseworthy or, or um, wildly effective... Um, and obviously my fault that it's effective, um, you know, maybe I won't be as, as likely to pursue that, that path, um, which obviously um, you, it, it's a good thing in that I'm going to avoid failing paths. It's a bad thing in that I'm going to um, avoid paths that I don't even know for sure are going to fail and that they are for selfish reasons. Um, so on one side, it, it's, it's a driver. It drives you to want to do well, yes. um, to to do things excellently, mm-hmm. and but there's like a threshold of I'm willing to push this hard, but once it passes that threshold of of certainty of a return, I might just completely cut it. it, it there's a, I think I think in photo- <laughs> photographic terms, you know, there's a there's a a white point that is set too low, um, where if I goes above I have no that, idea what that, that means. <laughs> nobody knows what that means. Um, if I get up to a certain risk, well, I think I think this would make sense to people. If I get up to a certain risk level of I don't think I can do this um, as happy as I want to do it, I will not try and fail. I will just not try. I won't I won't pursue it because um, if I try and fail, I'm concerned about um, is that is that breaking that rule that. Um, is are people going to see that as 
as, is that going to reflect poorly on me? Is that going to get someone upset with me? Um, and, and, you know, that's the most extreme example, but um, I think that that sometimes is how that manifests itself in my modern day. So I can see definitely the bad and the good side. I'm not sure I would, I would categorize them the same way that you would. Mm, okay. And I'll jump in here um, so that you're not alone in this, in this one, because I think this is common <laughs> to the human experience, which is to say, we want to be, no one wants to fail. No one likes to fail. Uh, I've never met anyone who's like, you know what I really love? Uh, failing. Yeah. You know, it's just not, it's just not something people like. And so, you know, you use the point of risk, like everyone's got a different tolerance for risk. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you, you hear about these entrepreneurs who like make, you know, like try a million, you know, Edison, you yeah, know, yeah. thousand light bulbs before he makes a light bulb. Well, you know, we got a, light, a lot of light bulbs in this room right now while we're talking. Good job, Edison. Uh, you know, <laughs> worked you. out pretty well. Uh, but he had to be willing to fail a lot and to push through a lot of failure. And, and so he had to have a high risk. Uh, failure, what I'm just going to call risk tolerance. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of us have one, right? Because nobody likes to fail. So the question is, how uh, how much tolerance do we have for risking failure? And and what's driving that? Mm-hmm. What's driving that? Are we, is it mom and dad? Am I trying to measure up? Um, is it, you know, my friends? Is it the Lord? You know, you, you, you meet people who they live with almost a constant like guilt complex or yeah. they live in their shame a lot because they're not letting the cross do its work. Yeah. Um, and say, hey, look, yes, what you did was shameful. The, the, you have failed as a human being to live up to uh, the standard that you ought to, and yet there's grace, and, and mm-hmm. Christ has covered that, and you need to live, instead of living in the shame and guilt of a failure, you need to live in the joy of forgiveness and, and what Christ has done for you. And that's the whole point. To do anything less is to make something less of the cross than it is, right? So there's that side with like sin and failure there. Then there's just like the... For instance, um, if you said, I need you to draw a picture of mm-hmm. you know, anything but a stick figure, okay, I would fail. I can just tell you right now, there's not, it's not even like up for debate. I cannot draw well. I, for those of you who've seen my handwriting, it is not something to um, you know, behold. It's, <laughs> it's barely something to read. And so I am not particularly gifted. My daughter, on the other hand, is very gifted. At at drawing, okay, uh, and and at and at writing, or at, at at you know different forms of of of, uh, of art. Or Lori Roy, who's in the church, is a sculptor. Yeah. If I tried to sculpt something, it would look like a blob. That's what it would look like because I have no idea. Um, but she's very gifted in it. Okay, so there are things that I know just out of hand. I will fail at, and then there's so I'm not going to try them. Okay. If I if I was going to try them, it would involve all kinds of like training first, right? Then there's things that I feel like I am decently good at. Like I know how to make a ham sandwich. Okay? Uh-huh. So I'm willing to try that um, because well, let's not say ham because none of it's delicious. Let's say a uh, grilled cheese sandwich. Okay. Because that sounds more delicious to me right now. Okay. Um, it's close to lunchtime. Um, it is I can make there. a grilled cheese sandwich. That's something that I can do. I got, I, I'm good to, to feel like there's not a high risk there. I'll go ahead and make a real cheese sandwich. Okay. I know this sounds all silly, but the point is, is there's different, there's like a spectrum. Mm. Um, your, what you're describing is you're drawing your line on risk tolerance pretty far down the spectrum to where you don't, if, if there's much risk at all, you don't want to, you don't want to go that direction. Although I think that while I do think that's true about you, uh-huh. I think that you're you've moved that line since I've known you. Okay, you know that's been short. That's- yeah, I, well, and 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 I'll tell you, and I want to come back to fully explain what I'm saying, but I'll I'll give you this uh, insight. When you when I felt that the Lord was calling us to bring you on, mm-hmm. you know, there were other applicants who were far more experienced. Uh huh. Because you're like 15, you know, right? No, you're <laughs> plus some, <laughs> right? You're, what, are you 24 yet? 23 still. 23. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're 23 years old. There are obviously there are people who were much older than that, you know, and had had been doing it for a long time. And I looked at at you know what the Lord was looking for for our church, and uh, you know, kind of who we are as a church, and and sort of there's a there's kind of a rawness to like who we are as a church, and we don't not everything is super refined or overproduced or or that type of thing, and and I felt strongly not just me but others who I was uh, who I was counseling with over over bringing somebody to do what what you're doing. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like look, we're looking for somebody who has the potential, 
Yeah. Not necessarily somebody who's got it figured out. Yeah. Right. And so I I saw that all the building blocks were there for the potential for you to have what I would call a high ceiling um, uh, and the ability to grow substantially. And so since I thought, okay, maybe this person over here has lots of experience, but their head's hitting the ceiling. Like yeah. they're probably not going to grow substantially. They're kind of locked into their thing. They're probably not going to grow substantially beyond this thing. And, but maybe today, they're more experienced than Hunter, and they and they could do this thing or that thing, mm-hmm. um, you know, more uh, from from their experience more than Hunter. But Hunter's in this situation. While today he's he's in this place, he's got this high ceiling to grow into, and and I think that his ceiling is much higher than this. So I'm working through that, thinking about when we're thinking about excellence, when we're thinking about succeeding, when we're thinking about those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw you as somebody who would would be able to grow, but you also would have to have enough of a risk tolerance to A, say, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Which I think part of that was just ignorance. You just didn't know what you <laughs> yeah, were in yeah. for. Um, but you had to have the risk tolerance to say, yeah, I'll do that. I see what the expectations are. I know I probably can't meet them today, but I'm willing to grow into them. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it, just in that, I, I saw a, a level of, of risk tolerance that you had for trusting the Lord. And yeah. isn't that's really what we're talking about, right? Because when we're talking about risk, we're talking about trust. We're talking yeah. about can we trust the Lord to grow us to where we need to be? Or to trust the Lord that if this doesn't go right, he still has us. Right. That that if we fail, because if we fail, it doesn't mean we shouldn't trust the Lord. It right. means well, but uh, the question is, if we fail, but we've done everything we've been called to do, then the Lord has has determined for us to fail in that situation, and and has and, and has something different for us. If we succeed, then the Lord has determined for us to succeed, and He's given us what we need for that. And so, but if you fail and you didn't do what you could do. Did you not trust the Lord, and that's why you failed? I th- I think that generally speaking, if uh, well, you got to be very careful with that. Yeah, I know it's it's you and you can't make that. You definitely should not make the determination for someone else unless you. Well, I, I think it's more dangerous when you try to do it for yourself. Oh, um, I see. I think that people beat themselves up like I could have done, could have, would have, should have, right? right if right. I just would have done this, if I just would have studied more, if I just would have this, I just would have that. Unless you sat on your, you know, back end, uh-huh. you know, eating bonbons and watching soap operas every day of your life, you probably were doing. If you're that concerned about it afterwards, right. you probably yeah, yeah, you probably were putting a, a reasonable amount of effort into it. Um, there is nothing. It's like, well, I could have done more. I could say that about anything. You yeah, could just yeah. never sleep and just always do, you know, it, that's people beat themselves up sometimes over yeah. that. I would say, you know, you know what it looks like to do your best. And here's the deal also you're always going to fail at that. You're, you're never going to uh, do your actual best. Yeah. You're, you're never going to be able to never take a break or never, yeah. you know, have an off day or never. That's just, you're a human being in a fallen world. Yeah. Um, and so, the, but getting back to sort of the risk tolerance thing and, and, and personalities and, and what it does for us, I think all of us ha- are somewhere on that spectrum. Mm-hmm. You know, where are we? And then the question is, how does God use us? And this is what I like about this is it's sort of it's sort of a foundational one because it's not about a particular skill set. It's about your your tolerance for risk and is the Lord growing you and trusting Him to push you to be willing to do things that have a greater chance of, of failure mm-hmm. that that are be, kind of like one of these. Hey, look, you know, Moses is like, I don't, I don't talk good, right? And and the Lord's I like, not the I will talker. be, I will be there for you. And that, no, no, I don't talk it. Fine, bring Aaron with you, right? Um, and, you know, for those of you, this is in the Old Testament. Um, you should know this story, but if you don't, you know, you can read about it. Um, you know, you've got you've got these situations where it's like the Lord calls us to do something. We're like, Lord, I'm I'm not equipped. I'm not prepared. But if He's called you to do it, He's going to equip you to do it. And as you're being transformed and as you're growing from a child who is scared of lots of things, right? And mm-hmm. as you described, I want to make fear of all every rule because I don't want to upset anybody. To uh, you know, an adult, a man or a woman who is strong and confident in the Lord, mm-hmm. who's saying, Lord, whatever you call me to do, I'm going to have the risk tolerance to step out and trust you in this thing and mm-hmm. that you're going to help me to do it. I think that one of our one of the signs of maturity of becoming from a child to an adult to a man or a woman of, of Christ being transformed is seeing that you're willing to step out in more and more scary situations, more and more difficult situations, more and more of that stuff that makes you weak in the knees yeah. um, and just trusting the Lord to do it. Do you feel like that's been the way it is for you? Yeah, certainly. You know, there are those things that, you know, this is... This is something I've got to do, and it puts a pit in my stomach. But 
um, you know, I trust God that it's something that I need to do and that he is going to lead me through it. And, and, you know, it's not, it's not fun going into that situation, but usually it's, um, good succeed or fail looking back at it afterwards and going, um, that was an awesome opportunity to trust you and to, um, put myself in a situation where you could use me, um, whether you did or not, it, but I put my, I was, I was available, right. um, to, to be used by you. And, uh, that's, that's something I've, I've had a couple of chances to experience the looking back at it going, that went great or that went, ooh. um, but at least being able to appreciate that I trusted God and, um, was available for him to use. Um, and you know, and it'll teach me how I could be better available and how I could be better prepared. Uh, maybe I've got the availability thing down, but I'm not prepared for the situations that are out there. Um, and so it's a great uh, process. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I was younger, I used to, when I first started learning how to golf, and I still haven't learned how to golf, but I've been doing it for a really long time. But when I was young, um, I started golfing and I would go out and I'd play. I remember I'd get so angry. Uh, this was part of my makeup as a young person, which is hopefully not too much of my makeup now. One of the <laughs> things that the Lord has transformed me in is, is uh, my temper, you know, that mm-hmm. type of thing. But I remember, you know, I'd, it'd be my 20th horrible shot of the hole um, <laughs> as opposed to the round. And I remember one time like throwing my golf club bag down and literally pulling every club out and throwing it. You know, <laughs> just like stupid. Just of course I gotta go pick them all up. Yeah. Right? yeah. Just throwing really every yourself. like one just pulling everyone out and throwing it because I'm so frustrated. I remember I have I have a buddy, um, a guy named Kes Romano, who's a good golfer, uh, a very close friend of mine. And I remember when we were younger, him sort of saying, Look, if if all you ever do is come out here once a week, once every couple of weeks and play a round of golf. Your expectations of being successful are unrealistic. Broken. <laughs> yeah. You're you're very unrealistic in your expectation that you're going to be good at golf. If you want to be good at it, you've got to practice, you've got to play all the time, you gotta spend the time, you gotta chip, putt, go to the thing, you know, go to the range, do all that stuff that that good golfers do. Of course he would know because he was a good golfer. Yeah. Or or else when you come here, expect to be bad because you haven't put the time in to be yeah, good, yeah. right? And so one of the things that I would say about the risk factor thing is part of what we're worried about is if we're not going to be the very best the first time we try it, then forget it. We don't even want to do it, right? right it's right. like it's like okay, you know, I'll go to Honduras and I'll and you know bring bring a team from from the church and don't let the, any, this turn anybody off to come to Honduras. But sometimes I'll put people in situations where I'll be like, look, I want you to preach tonight. <laughs> You know, at this small, you know, we're having a small church service, not that many people, but I want you to have an opportunity to, or, or not preach, but maybe I want you to share this story mm-hmm. not about yourself or whatever. And it's like, whoa, 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 way out of their comfort zone. And right, I right. think part of it is like, well, if I can't come up and be Billy Graham, you know, then I don't want to do it. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, no, no. Because that's what you're used to, especially in our world today, you're used to seeing perfection yeah. in everything. And there's, And you want to be... You know, you want to feel like you can do that too. There's a couple issues there. We'll get into those in a second. But, but the point is, is that you're sitting there thinking, oh well, I can't do it perfectly, so I can't do it. How about you have to go up there and stumble and whatever? Better to do it in front of uh, ten people who already think you're great and who are, you know, going to be so supportive and whatever, and stumble around in it than you know and learn yeah. than to just never step out in it. Right, right. This other part though that I that is is a problem is. If our if our desire for excellence, especially something like sharing something in, in a church service that I ask somebody to share, if your desire is look, if everyone's not going to come up to me afterwards and say you're the best, right? You're literally, I mean, the first time you've ever spoken in public, you are the best preacher on the on the planet Earth. You are the most amazing thing. I've given you a hundred thousand likes on Facebook, and everybody thinks you're the best. And what if then what is it that you're looking for? Is it really God that you were looking to please there, or people? Right. And so, what's your risk tolerance about? Is it about oh, I'm worried that I'm going to disappoint God? I don't think so. I think normally it's I'm because he's the one asking you to do it, right? Right, right? I think normally it's I'm willing. I'm going to look bad in front of people. I'm willing. I'm not going to get the praise and adulation that I'm looking for. Right. And I'm just and this is me. I'm talking about myself. Yeah, you know, just being honest before the Lord and before the <laughs> podcast audience that I certainly have struggled with this type of thing. Like you know, you want to feel like you're good at it, and sometimes you're wanting to feel like you're good at it for reasons that are not the right ones. Right? Uh, do you find that at all in your life? Yeah, I definitely think that's. That's what I was trying to to convey earlier was um, I don't 
I, if I don't want to do something, it's usually not because um, I'm afraid of failure itself. It's more I'm afraid of uh, people not thinking I'm great, you know? Um, not that I really... People, I, I don't have any impression that people think I'm great anyway, um, but I'm afraid of of confirming what people think or or um, hurting even more what people think about me. Um, and, you know, I've definitely shed that fear some, um, especially since high school. I think high school is a rough time for for worrying about pe- what people think about you. But yeah. um, as I got started getting through college, any, and then college, it was kind of the same thing again because you have this new group of peers that you really admire and you really want them to to like you, and then you start to not care what they think about it. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you guys actually aren't that great. Right. Just kidding, college friends. Um, but, you know, uh, you you get t- uh, to a point where you're willing, where you're not so concerned about yourself and you're more concerned about um, the people that you're speaking to. If it's, you know, taking your example of, of preaching. I was a preaching major, and uh, I am not currently a preacher, and I think that's for a reason. Um <laughs> You know, it was something that I was really uncomfortable with, um, but eventually I decided, you know what, I don't care that this does not look good on me. Um, I'm only going to do this because uh, it is, to an extent, what I think God was calling me to do. And um, because in that moment, you know, I still, I I taught youth group last week and um, when, when, you know, when Glenn asked me to do it, I... I cringe uh, and I go, okay, here we go. <laughs> We're going to do this. Um, but, you know, I I don't see it as an opportunity for myself. I see it as an opportunity opportunity for God and in a way that takes off the pressure to be perfect, you know? Um, yeah. Because you're going to do your best. God, God is aware of what your best is. God is not um, going to ask you to do something and then go, why didn't you do it? Ten times better than what you than what you ever could have done it. Um, you know, God God is aware of your best, and as long as you are um, doing your the best you can do, He is going to be faithful to to bless that. And that might not be success. God's blessing might not be success. God's blessing might well, be... well, it'll be success. But that success might not be what who's you de- who's picture. defining the yes. success. Yes, right. So that, that, that. it'll be success. God's success. It'll be it'll be a success. Whenever you're following the Lord, it's going to be success. The question is, are you willing to be a fool for Christ? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to be? Um, and and all I mean is, in the eyes of the world, are you willing to be put in a situation where other people might look at you and not think it's the greatest, or not think whatever, or not think highly of you? But but God does, and and He's got it for a reason. He's got. I mean, look. There have been people who have who have died for the name of Jesus Christ to this day all over the world. There are people who are persecuted mm-hmm. for the name of Christ. What is it? What is it? Uh, you know, they, they've had to give up their whole life. We're worried about not getting the likes on Facebook half the time. These people are giving up their lives to to follow what Christ has called them to do because they have an eternal view. And uh, if our judge, if our if the way that we analyze or judge what success looks like, what risk looks like, whatever, is always about pleasing people or or having people adore us or, or you know, be, if it's self-interested, then we're always going to struggle. We're always going to have these issues and so on. And, and I'm not saying, by the way, that, that you should not care what other people think. You should be focused on, on being relevant. You should be focused on, uh, you know, social... Uh, Let's just call it um, awareness, manners, awareness. Yeah, social awareness. Yeah, staying woke. Yeah, you, you should be. Well, that's a different kind of social that, uh, awareness. But yeah, <laughs> you should you should be you should be focused on making sure that you're not purposely offending people. Right. right. But there's a difference between that and always trying to make much of your own name. Right. When when the the thing we're supposed to be doing is making much of the name of Jesus. You know, that's the deal. Well, there's a, there's a difference between what Paul did um, before the Areopagus where he you know Paul says, um, I become all things to all so that I become what did he say? I become a, a Gentile to the Gentiles, I become a Jew to the Jews. Um, that's different than this idea of of ear tickling, saying the right things to get praise for yourself. What Paul's doing is he's is he's being socially aware. He's being culturally aware um, in order to basically speak the language, whether that's um, you know using particular. You know, if you're talking to doctors, you got to talk differently than you're going to talk to um, track athletes or something like that. You know, um, 
you you have to be socially aware of of what you're dealing with so that you can um, be the most effective that you can be. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, and there, and, and look, that's part of loving other people, though. See, that's certain certain level of social awareness, certain level of social is just is is about being outward. It's not about you. Mm-hmm. It's not, hey, I want to make sure that I'm that I'm being kind or being thoughtful, so that this person will think a lot of me. The problem is, it's so easy to to let to let Satan twist and in our own and our own evil desires to twist everything that we do into how does this make me look. What are these people thinking about Certainly. me? You know, why? Why are you know? I'm not. I'm not a particularly outgoing. Well, it depends. Yeah. Half of me is. You know, it depends on the situation. But right. generally speaking, if I walk into a room, of people I know nobody. Mm-hmm. Why is it that? What am I worried about? What? Why is it? Why is it nerve wracking for us to do that? Well, because we're worried about what all these people think about us, right? Mm-hmm. We don't want to become embarrassed. We don't want to be. But I mean, you know, unless you're going to start picking your nose in the middle of the room, it's unlikely you're going to be embarrassed. So what is it? Yeah, it's this desire to have the the applause of men. Mm-hmm. You know, it's this desire to have. It's this fear of man stuff. And and you know, it's, there's there's. Lots of uh, you can look at you could listen to sermons on this. You could probably read books on this. The the idea of being afraid of people, but it, you know this this risk tolerance thing. So much of it is wrapped up in this in this fear of failure, which is defined as a fear of not looking as good as as I want to. Why? Mm-hmm. If you go on social media and it's you look at a lot of the posts, there's a Very lot selective. of there's a lot of fishing for approval mm-hmm. from people. Mm-hmm. You know, and look, I'm not. I'm not uh, um, calling out any one particular type of post or any uh, particular, uh, you know, type of style of posting or what. I'm just saying there is. It, it appears to the outward observer so much so that it's cliche that people talk about this as though it's just a normal part of social media. That there's a lot of people who are looking to to receive back from the social media community the approval that they're looking for. You all, you don't just see it there. You see a guy or a girl who dates somebody else um, and you're thinking, "What? Is, this is a weird match of these two people. And you, and, and you can tell that for one of them, it's a pure self-esteem play. They need you know, codependency, all these different things in life. We get, we get so chained to needing to have other people give us the value, mm-hmm. and give us those feelings that, that, uh, that make us feel uh, valuable. Okay, right. uh, good. and sometimes even worse, it's not even just feeling valuable. You already feel valuable. You you just want more of it. Yeah, you know that that arrogance, that pride. That you know it can be anywhere on the spectrum. From I feel totally not valuable at all. Let me find that value in other people telling me that I'm attractive, smart, good at skateboarding. I don't know whatever yeah. you know whatever it is, so that I can get that. The problem is, is that it's a it's diminishing returns like any addiction. Uh-huh. If you're addicted to the praise of men, it's a, it, there's diminishing returns, right? You're you, it's never enough. Yeah. You can't get enough Facebook likes to to actually give you value because they don't give value. Right. And you know, it's it's kind of so you you preached on Sunday and you gave a little picture of um you know, you get you get 10 degrees off but 10 miles down the road you're well, Julie will tell us how far. Um, you're, but you're, but you're far away right. from from the destination that you're supposed to go to. If you're supposed to go um, straight and you went ten degrees off, you're going to be far away. And I think it's really easy, you know. Maybe so. Here's the situation: um, you see um, an elderly person coming out of a store, and you see that they're going to have trouble carrying their groceries and also getting the door open. So you open the door for them. And you're just doing that because you love that person. You, you you don't know them, but you care about them, and you want them to not hurt themselves. You want them to um, not have to go through any more struggle than is necessary. And so you open the door for them. Someone sees you and says, oh, that was so nice of you. If suddenly now you go, oh, I'm going to look for doors to open so that I get that praise, right. all of a sudden you've twisted what was once love into self-love. Right. And, and I think that's probably a majority of sin. I think a majority of sin. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Yeah. There's that twist is ever present mm-hmm. for... For me, I can't speak for everybody else, but generally speaking, if if there's a letter in my mailbox, I'm guessing it's in yours too. Um, C.S. Lewis <laughs> does kind of a thing on that, but um, I I I recognize how easily and how quickly I can walk in to a situation. Let's take a sermon for instance, and be like, Holy Spirit, I need I need you to empower me here. I want you know I'm praying for it that that the Lord is gonna is gonna bring to the people what He wants to be here. This is an act of love for that others. Is, that it's and gonna for the be Lord. effective. That it's gonna be whatever. 
um, you know, for that he's going to use it for you once. And I can tell you that I have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in situations where I was unable to myself even preach because I wasn't feeling well or because, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I know what that's like, uh, the power the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. But how easy is it also to be like, well, I wonder, did, did, was it any good? Now I'm now instead of worrying about, look, I, I gave that to the Lord. Yeah. If it was if it was effective for people, then it was effective. That's his thing. Right. But if I start wondering, well, was it any good? You know, did did it have an effect on people? Was it the, now? It's about me. Right, now right. it's about oh, well, you know, not necessarily. It could be, did I do, could I have done that better for the Lord? I think there's a there there's can be that, that, but let's. I'm just being honest right, with right, you. Right. It's it's just as likely to be. Right. Was this was this really good? Was this really effective? Was it you know, uh -huh. um, you know what? And it happens with me with leading worship too. It's yeah. it you know it starts out. Um, hopefully, it starts out with with really. Uh, worthy intentions that are very godly and very loving and I want you know I want this congregation to be able to um, worship God um, without um, any distractions and and to um, a a higher level than they they have been able to because um, and, and I want my efforts to be um, leading to that but it's very easy for that all of a sudden to turn into um, did I get any complaints do I need to should I should, do I need to change something? And it's not because I want to change. It could be I want to change something because you know God's calling me to change it, and He's using these people to tell me that. But it could. It, it's a lot of times also, or only. Uh, I don't want people to not like me, so I'm yeah. going to. Um, I'm going to do this better. I'm going to change this, or I'm going to yep. um, try to make myself more pleasing to people rather than God more pleasing to people. I, I mean, it's just it's just a temptation. It just is now now that does, just because there's a temptation, just because that bird flies by your head doesn't mean you have to let it make a nest right, right. in your hair. And so it, there's a the the job of the believer, whatever it is. Of course, there's an analog to this in everything that we do. Right? Is is my does my wife think I look good today? Does my you know whatever? That's fine. You should want your wife to think you look good. Um, someday my wife may think I look good. I don't know. It's it's keep almost working. twenty years now. I'm going to keep trying, but. <laughs> You know, it, you you can. There's things that are okay. It's okay for you to want your spouse to think that you look good. That's mm -hmm. okay. But if your value is there, because if it's about them enjoying the way you look, then that's great. But if it's about I don't feel valuable unless this person thinks this thing about me, then you got a problem. The same thing with whatever it is in your life. Analyze why do you feel bad? Where mm -hmm. is it coming from? Right? Is it you? You've all of a sudden come to believe that the Lord doesn't love you. You've all of a sudden come to believe that the Lord doesn't value you, or is it something different? Is it, I'm not feeling praised enough. I'm not feeling um, appreciated by other people enough. And, and then and then a bitterness comes in, and then all kinds of evil comes from that. Divisions, right. difficulties. I mean, all, all the way down to murders and and adulteries and all sins. You know, you can trace some, a lot of these things back to, I wasn't feeling fulfilled enough. I wasn't feeling liked mm -hmm. enough. I wasn't feeling like people thought I was important enough. And so, you know, you you your your lust for uh, for feeling important mm -hmm. can cause all kinds of problems. And I think that when we go back, we look all the way back to where we were as children, mm -hmm. um, and and how that how our personalities have been shaped in that way for so long. We we idolize essentially uh, athletes movie stars, whatever. And they spend all this time trying to look a certain way and act a certain way and say th certain things in public and whatever until you go and meet them and realize, dude, these are just completely normal, regular human beings with all the problems that everybody else has. But because we only see them in, in, in this context, we think, ooh, these are very special people. I want to be thought of as a very special person like that. And now we have Instagram and Facebook where you can put only the pictures where you look the very best and take it from a certain angle and do whatever so that it looks like you to the sort You can of make world yourself a celebrity. You can make yourself a celebrity at some level where what you're putting out is only a very very small uh, view of who you are. Hey, let me just let me just make this really easy for everybody. Every person struggles. Every person's, you know, poop smells. Every person, you know what I mean. Everybody toots. Everybody to varying degrees. To varying what degrees. You eat. That's right. Your diet has has an effect on that. We can <laughs> maybe do a podcast on that someday. That's actually we, what we this won't. podcast is about. Right. No. We everyone has a point. problems. Everyone has problems. I don't care how 
pretty they are, how much money they have, or how, how smart they seem, or whatever. They all have problems, and they're, a lot of them are the same problems. And the only thing that makes any of them valuable is that they were made by God and loved, and that God loves them. And if we could stay in that and live in that and walk in that, boy, I, I, the world it would not take a moment. The world would be a completely different place. But mm-hmm. instead, we scratch and claw for the attention, the affection of others. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, yes, I think that this is one that that starts young. We didn't get to get into a lot of. Um, a lot of the different personality traits uh, because we're going to run out of time here. But I think that this is a is an important one because of the way it shapes and because of the way that God transforms us in us. So the good news is this. As the Lord transforms us, that, that trust for Him becomes higher. That placing of our value more in Him and less in people becomes more and more and more prevalent to, till you get to the point where um, you can be all things to all men so that by all means you might save some or that through you Christ might save some. You can do all that stuff, but you're not. But your but your value, your your emotions, your value isn't moving up and down on whether or not people thought that uh, you did a great job at work today, or you you know did a great job playing the guitar to this morning, or I preached great, or this person you know whatever it is, whatever your job is, whatever your relationship, is, it's not all based on did you succeed. Did you meet the the expectations of this other person so that they can lavish you with praise so that you can feel valuable? That's no longer the thing. If you, if you want their praise, you want it not because it's about you, but because it's, because it's an indication that you've been able to serve them well. Mm -hmm. If you can switch that around, um, and really, really find your value in the Lord, uh, you are moving a long way, uh, away from sin and towards excellence in serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. We are go, part of going from that first verse we read, right? When I was a child, I acted like a child and so on, thought like a child. Part of going from being a child to being a mature a, a, adult, a strong woman or man of, of God is getting to this point of mm-hmm. finding our strength because that's because anchoring into our value in Christ is going to raise that risk tolerance level. It's going to put us in a position where we're willing to do more and more, which means that he's going to use us more It's, and more. it's going. I like how you said anchored. You're, you're anchored into that. Um, think of it like like you're you're rock climbing. You're anchored into um, Christ, which is an anchor that you can trust. And now you're free with all your other limbs to to try and do this. And it's okay if you fail in that and you slip off because you're still anchored in right. um, to the love of Christ, and and nothing will change that. And so you're free to you know if you're if you're a climber you'll. I'm not even a climber. I don't know why I have this metaphor in my head, but you're you're free to try this this grab to reach another spot. You're free to to check out this this hole that you can reach for, um, or and that would work. You know, if you were um, sh- sailing on a ship, you're free to if you're anchored into the love of Christ, you're free to go fishing. You're free to do something else with your hands besides try to keep your ship in one spot. Um, and if you're not anchored into that, you're always so dependent on on the one thing that you're doing in front of you to give you that stability that stability or or importance um you could look at it either way um that you're 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 always floundering and you're always right. um you know at risk of falling off the cliff or at risk of um losing your your bearings in the sea you know with right. those two metaphors. In the Bering Sea. I hope we have a Your lot of rock climbers Bering and sea. sailors listening today. I, I think most people understand that, the, the, the metaphor that you're using, you know, to, if, you're, if your value is anchored in Christ, you can fall and you ain't going to fall far. Yeah. Because, right. because that rope's going to hold for secure. But if you're, if you're anchoring your value in other people... Don't fall. That's gone in, a, in an instant. <laughs> Don't fall because you're going all the way down. Yeah. Because there is nothing. Because people cannot provide that which God was the only one who ever has been able to or ever could provide it. Right. Uh, the only one who can give you the true value um, is the one who has given you that value, is the one who's made you, who's created you, who's thought about you before the foundation of the world, who knit you together in your mother's womb, uh, the God of creation, the God that loves you, the God that died for you. He's already shown you through the cross how valuable you are. Don't go to other people to try to find that. Right. So let's pray and we'll close this one out. Father, I just I thank you for the fact that I can trust you, uh, that, that our value is in you. 
uh, that Hunter's value is in you, that, that our family's values are in you, that, that our church's value is in you, that all the people in the world, that their value is in you, that you love them so much, Lord. And I pray that through this podcast, through the ministry of Acts Church on, on Sunday mornings and the different things that we do, that we would continue to preach the message that you are, you are a God of redemption, of restoration, of transformation, and that you are a God who loves them and who values them, and that they can live in that reality regardless of what's going on around them. And we just thank you for uh, people, <laughs> for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for, for those that will become our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray that if there's anyone who's listening to the podcast today who is not feeling valuable, who has been running around trying to find value in, in other people or in, or in other things or in drugs or in alcohol and addiction and, and anything like that, that, Lord, that they would lay that down and that right now they would come and just give them their lives to you. They would choose to follow you and believe on you, Lord, that you rose from the dead, that you died on the cross for our sins, and that through your death and resurrection, we can have peace with you. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to another Acts Church podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to check out some more podcasts on our podcast page, which is on SoundCloud. You can also follow us on iTunes. We would love it if you would comment on those or leave us a review. It uh, really helps to be able to see some feedback on what we're doing. We hope that it's impacting you. And so, um, yeah, comments and, and write reviews so that we can see how it's affecting you and how um, we can continue to do that. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you next time.